speaking on today. And we're going to be speaking about the unspoken hero. And the unspoken hero is probably one of the most, if I was to ask uh, probably 90-some percent of the people inside the room who the unspoken hero, they would tell me different ones from the Bible. But I'm sure that probably close to 100%, unless you've ever heard me share briefly on this, know that my unspoken hero is none other than Job's wife. And the scriptures only speak one statement about this here, individuals, that it says about her. There's many other things that are brought out that we're going to see that are implied and are strongly, strongly substantiated from the scripture. But she doesn't tell us where she's from. We don't know her parents, who they were. We don't know the town that she came from. All we know is that, and we don't even know what her name is. All we know is that Job was married. Come on. And he had a wife. And she was known for one statement in the heat of the battle and in the grief and the agony and despair that she was in. She came to her husband who was walking in integrity, walking uprightness. And she said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Why don't you just give up in life and just die? How many know when you're already down, that's probably not the most encouraging word to say? Okay, but that's all that we know about her so far that she says that's written in the scripture. But she's mine after many, many years of studying the word of God and going in there and actually even writing about her as the part of the dispassionate brothers in my book on the five tests of faith out there. I found out that, you know, Job's wife is in there and I put her in there as the dispassionate brother with the limited revelation that I had at that time. So if I do a reprint on that one, I'm going to put another whole chapter in there just on his wife. And it's going to be part of this here sermon today. So who, why is she my unspoken hero? Well, I'm going to get to that towards the end of the service. But at the beginning of the service, when we go to 1 chap, Peter chapter 5, I want to lay a foundation for you. And it's very, very important that you understand what I'm going to share right now. How many know the Old Testament writers didn't have the revelation of the New Testament that you and I have today? The New Testament brings explanation to a lot of things in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, many of the uh, aspects of the Old Testament sacrifices, the peace offering, the first fruits offering, all those, how many know all those offerings were significant, but how many know that Christ is the first fruits offering today? The first fruits of many others. So we're on this side of the cross. But in the Old Testament, they had limited understanding of the spiritual battles that were going on. Just like today, there's many that are even here inside the church that have limited understanding of the arena and of the world that we're living in today. There's concepts that people have of God that go totally contrary to the Word of God. How many know it's not God, but how many know it's the thief that comes to steal? Come on. To kill and to destroy. We know that from the Scriptures in John 10.10. 10. So if it's stealing from your life, if it's killing from your life, if it's taking from your life, paralyzing your life, you know that it's not God doing that to his beloved children. Come on. In the same respect, we can see in the book of Acts chapter 10, the summary of the apostle Peter when he was over at Cornelius, the first Gentile converts that came into the church world, and he actually spoke and summarized the whole works of Jesus from the gospels, and he said that, uh, it said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost in power, who went about, come on, doing what? Doing good and healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil. So he was able to summarize where the pain came from. He was able to summarize, and he's the one that shares about the thief. He's the one that shared about the trials that we go through out there and how the evil one. And so in his letter over here in 1 Peter, he gives us some specific details, and he's not blaming God for his trials. He's not blaming God for the problems because he recognized some things that were going on. Are you all there? And so it's very important that you understand this as we start that Satan is a legalist. And Satan needs legal entry to just put harm and to inflict upon a believer today. How many know that? And if, if you don't understand this here aspect, then you're going to become very confused as a believer in life. And if, if you believe like many things, we just throw everything up in a pot potpourri and we just put everything in wherever it lands and we say, well, this is God and, and this is not God. And there's people even in this room that are probably mad at God or you might not say it out loud, but there's thoughts that you don't believe that God is faithful. You don't believe that God is just. You don't believe that God is fair. You don't believe that God is trustworthy. And basically in life, we've learned that good things... Uh, uh, excuse me, bad things happen at times to good people. 
And you're going to learn that. Why? Because we live in a fallen world, and what we realize is that Satan is a legalist, and he's looking for points of entry. I asked a few months back about how many in here, after I had preached the message on, on bitterness in here, and how many, uh, the, hand, the hands that went up was shocking. It was probably over 50% of hands went up in the church in both services. And people came up and the altars were filled as we ministered God's grace to them. But the reality is, how many know that the enemy is looking for opportunities to inflict harm into your life? He's looking for cracks to look for inside of your life. And he's also looking for lures that he will send out there in bait that he can get you to take so that he can pull you away from your love relationship and your walk with God, but not just with God, with one another, because usually the temptations that the enemy brings our way is usually relational temptations. Jesus said, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then he said, lead us not into temptation. Well, what's to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one? Well, the evil one is a person that has baits and, and hooks out there to try to get you to take those hooks. As a strategist, the enemy is there to try to strategize who it is that he can use in your life to push your buttons so that he can pull you right in. And many people aren't even aware of that, of, of this battle that is going on in the spiritual realm. We also recognize that he's called the accuser of the brethren. It will not be until the book of Revelations uh, is being fulfilled. And I believe we're in the beginning point of that now. And I'm not here to argue with individuals of the last uh, or the middle, if you want to call it, 14 chapters. I believe they're beginning to be fulfilled right now. I'm really studying the seals right now, the bowls and the judgments that are actually coming on the earth. And there's a lot of parallels that I can see and cautious about saying some things, but yet understanding that we're living in a very serious time in history. How many know that? The world knows it's going on. There's incredible fear that's in the world. But how many know that people should not be in fear, okay? Now, what I want to state with you right now is that when we go to the book of Job is you need to have this here down and understand this here. Around a believer's life, there's a hedge. Okay, if I didn't believe this, trust me, I would not be in this pulpit today. I believe this with everything in me that around the believer's life, when Jesus died, was buried and rose from the dead, man, he kicked devil butt, amen? And he gave us the victory today. And I believe that with everything in me. But I also recognize that we have a, a fallen enemy that is still out there. And he's called a small G. He's called the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air. He has a arsenal of weapons that he uses against the mind, the will, and the emotions and the bodies of believers today. He has an arsenal that he'll use in the area of relationships and he pulls triggers and landmines and everything else that we would know today to try to sabotage relationships and all those there things. But he needs a point of entry to get the upper hand in our life. In the book of Job, when he came to God and he brought this here, Job was an integrous man. Job was a blameless man. Job was a good man. But Job also operated it in a spirit of fear. And the Bible teaches us, and this is so important that you get this here, God never called a one of us in this here room to live by fear. And yet there's people that are here today, they're afraid, their fear of failure, the fear of the unknown, the fear of the future, they're afraid in relationships, and their whole lives are basically paralyzed by the kingdom of darkness because their decisions and their motivation is actually fear-motivated and fear-based. And God tells you very, very strongly that fear is the spirit. And it didn't come from God, so if it didn't come, where was it in the garden? Uh, Adam said, I was afraid. Well, how many know it wasn't God that made him afraid? The whole world would have been different if he would have came to God rather than run from God. And so the Bible says, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So he calls fear a spirit. And that spirit of fear is a paralyzing fear. That spirit of fear is a destructive fear. And that spirit of fear has creative powers and abilities inside. So an example of that is you see people, their whole lives are anxious. Their whole lives are full of worries. Their whole lives are full of cares. And inside of their lives, they actually create, because they don't believe this, but they actually create things because fear has creative abilities and powers. Just like faith has creative abilities and powers. And how many know faith goes is a voice that is spoken by words that goes into the spiritual realm and it brings the things that are in the spirit realm into this natural realm. 
in the same respect, fear also operates the same way. And it has creative abilities and powers that people don't even realize. They speak things that come out of their life and they speak of, you know, I'm afraid that this one's going to do that or I'm afraid that my child's going to go off the deep end. I'm afraid that they're going to die and over. I'm afraid they're going to die prematurely. I'm afraid that my business is going to fail you. I'm afraid because of the society, what's going on today, of all the evils and the perils. And their whole lives are characterized by fear. And so Job, in Job 3, 25 and 6, it says, Job states this here, and it says, the thing that I greatly feared. This wasn't just a temptation that had hit in Job's life. It was a directive that came in an assignment from hell that actually brought the hedge down on Job's life. And it brought him into another whole territory that he didn't understand, his wife didn't understand, his friends didn't understand, and the people around him didn't understand. Because he was doing the right things. So in his heart and in his mind, he was doing the right things. But it was the motivation be fair. Because it says the thing, and this is so important that you get this here aspect before I teach. He said the thing that I greatly feared. It wasn't just the thing I feared, but a greatly feared. So that means it became a stronghold inside of his life. What we need to understand is the thoughts that we have today okay, when meditated on, when pondered upon, have creative abilities, and those thoughts can be good thoughts, or those thoughts can be bad thoughts. And if they're in the, in the negative realm, in the pessimistic realm, in the, in the fear realm, then they have creative ability. And Job said this here, he said, the thing that I greatly feared, the all-consuming things that I've been thinking of have come upon me. So the creative ability came to Job. Now that's the foundation that I need to lay for you as we go in to the book of Job in just a few moments because we're going to be speaking about this unspoken hero and you need to know how she got out of the thing that they did. So in 1 Peter chapter 5, we need to move along. It says, so humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And it says, and at the right time, notice what he's going to do. He will lift you up. And how's he going to lift you up? In what? In honor. But then he tells you the first action of what he wants you to do. Come on now. He says to give all your, come on, worries and what else? And cares to God. For why? Why? For he cares for you. Listen, if you're carrying the worries and the stresses and all the cares, okay, of people, if you're carrying all the worries and the cares of this here world, and your whole life is characterized by worries, how many know this is Peter that's writing this here? Okay, and you don't give them to God, or if you give them to God, then you go and you pick them back up. The enemy has already got a crack inside of your armor. So let's go to the next verse, if we will, in 1 Peter chapter 5. So what does God say in light of the cares, in light of the worry, in light of the fear, in light of distraction? He says, stay alert. Don't take that verse into its context and start in verse number 8 because verse number 7, stay alert from what? From the worries and the cares that come to smother your life. Stay away from the distractions. Stay alert from these here things and then watch out. Watch out for what? Come on. Your great enemy. How many know there's an enemy of my soul and there's an enemy of your soul? And what's an enemy? One that is opposed to every good thing that is going on inside your life. If you don't even realize that you are a target now from hell because you're an enemy. And before when the devil had you, how many know he didn't have any issues with you? He already had you. I've heard Christians say this, you know, I never had problems until I started going to church. Never had problems until I started speaking forth his word. Well, welcome to the word. That's the confirmation that you're in the will of God. It's the confirmation that God started something good. It's the confirmation that what he started is a good work, and he's going to complete that good work right up into the day of Jesus Christ. It's a confirmation that you're already an overcomer. It's, a com- uh, it's, it, 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 it's already a confirmation that you have a mandate from having to live by faith and not by sight. It's, it, 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 it's a confirmation that the Bible says in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God. Whatever circumstance has come give thanks for this is the will of God because it's a confirmation that you're on the right path and you're on the right track and the enemy wants to lie to get you off that track. So it says the devil. Well, what is it about the devil? Well, there's two Greek words and one is dia and the other is bolos. And when you look at these two words and you put them together, the word dia literally means thorough and it speaks about penetration. It speaks about not just a hook, But it speaks about a hook that gets your attention, and then you take that hook, and then what happens, it gets inside of you. 
And that's what I'm speaking. This isn't just a fleeting worry. This isn't just a fleeting care. This isn't just a fleeting fear that came across Job's path. This was a deep, deep wound now that got inside of his life that affected his own manner of thinking and his own manner of believing. And the second word is balos. So it's the word dia that speaks of thorough penetration. And then the word balo, and it means to throw. It means to throw slander at, to hurl against, to deceive. It speaks about that which is cruel, that which is is ill-tempered. It speaks about that which is false, that which is unjust. So what the enemy does is he hurls things against your mind to weaken you to the point that you let your guard down and you're no longer staying alert. Because once in a weakened state, he's got you where he wants you to be. And that's when he launches his all-out attack against your mind. Now, if you don't understand the battles going on, then he's already got you there. Or if you just believe that when we talk about the devil, we shouldn't be talking about the devil. No, the Bible says we are not ignorant of his, and it uses personal pronouns to speak of his devices, his strategies, his ways, his accusations, his deceptions, and his temptations. So if you don't understand that the enemy is a strategist, the enemy is a legalist, he's already got you where he wants you to be. And if you don't understand that the battles are going on around you, he's got you where he wants you to be. If you're in a lull into a sleep, and you just come to church on a Sunday morning, are you just check in on a Sunday morning and you check out the rest of the week with your spiritual journey. He's got you where he wants you to be. The enemy's got these snares and these pits and these traps and he wants to pull you off the assignment that God has for your life and for my life. Okay, now I said all that, okay. I've noticed in the journey and I've been on this path now with God for 41 years and I've noticed something in the journey of life that there are seasons that we all go through. There are seasons of hits that we go through. There are seasons of temptation where it just seems it increases more than the normal. There are seasons, listen very carefully, of of just, you want to just let down your guard. There are seasons that come our way at different times, and it's usually when things are going very well, or it's usually at times when things aren't going so well. And the enemy just strategizes in, and he knows your weaknesses, but he also knows the pinpoints of things that he can hit inside of your life to get you to trigger so that something can happen in a reaction that brings a response that is not honoring God. I've also rushed out with this here, the hardest hits against my life. And I look back, and I look over these here 41 years. And I look back and I look at the person that I've become and I look at some of the things that I had to go through that I didn't like when I went through them. But I look at them today and I'm saying, you know, God, those were the things that made me the person that I am today. They were the things that strengthened me. They were the things that helped me. Amen. Amen. And the biggest missiles that were sent against me to take me out so far in the journey has been that of betrayal. Because when you're a relational individual and you like to connect with individuals, the area that he's going to hit is in the area of betrayal. And betrayal speaks of in violation of trust. There can be no betrayal unless there was first trust. So I'm the type of person I like to make friends with people. I like to trust my daughters just like me in that their area. But how many know we oftentimes can set ourselves up because betrayal can't come unless there was first trust. And so I've learned this here. That's how the enemy hits against us, okay? Uh, Or through slander, or through misrepresentation, or taking what we have said and twisting it. I can't tell you how many times over the years, even on tapes and all the technology that we had, people actually hear something that wasn't said. And they come in and they, they, they come in and they're arguing with me, and I'm like, I didn't say that. You didn't hear what was said. And they say, Yes, I did. And so I just got the desktop to get the tape, and I bring the tape in, and I, and I played that part of the sermon. And they said, man, I heard something different. Well, how many know, listen very carefully, and I'm going to just make a brash statement right now. To the pure in heart, how many know all things are pure? Yeah, but if you've got a defiled heart, you've got a critical heart, you've got a judgmental heart, everything is impure. So no matter what you see, there's a filter that you will see things through that goes totally contrary to what God's Word has to say. That went really good. So if you're, listen very carefully. If you're married, and, 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 and you'll see your wife that way. 
to that filter. And that filter will bring a disconnection between your wife. If you're a husband, if you're a wife and you see your husband that way, it'll bring a disconnection. If you're a husband, see your wife that way, it will bring a disconnection. There's no way around it. And it's the bait of the enemy in the unseen world behind the scene that is bringing that in. Are you all there? So I've also heard stories of violations, stories of injustices, stories of abuse, stories of revenge, stories of gossip. And I have seen firsthand what bitterness can do to the hearts and the relationships in individuals' lives. How it can totally paralyze them and knock them out of the race. And sometimes it comes by betrayals. Sometimes it comes because of unmet needs, unhealed hurts, unresolved conflicts that go on inside the human soul. And so I've also seen good Christian men and women take hits in life from the enemy of our souls and turn them from a walk with God and then all of a sudden, the enemy has just so zeroed in on that area to turn and distort the character of God, twisted things that they get soured at God, they get cold-hearted at God. And I have heard at time after time so many say these here words to me, and these were the words that they said, so-and-so was a good man. So-and-so was a good woman. Why is it if they were good, why did evil or why did tragedy come and hit them in their home in such a way? Why did God allow it? Why did God permit it? Why do bad things happen to good people, Pastor Rick? So, well, first of all, I can answer that question very, very simply, okay? If bad things happen to the best person on the whole planet, and his name was Jesus Christ, and Jesus said, you know, when you want to come with me and hang with me, he said, not only am I welcoming you to the power to know the power of my resurrection, to know me and the power of my resurrection, but also into the fellowship of my sufferings. If you haven't even gotten that down to the very basics right now, then you don't know the God of the Bible. And so that's just the way it is in life, and it's the way it is in Scripture. It's not always going to be a bed of roses. So there'll be seasons that you hit, but let me just tell you something. A season is not a whole life. Seasons come and seasons go. So I am very, very cautious of individuals that, that their whole life is just, uh, is, is always tragedy. There's never no reprieve. There's never no. The Bible says even Jesus was tempted severely for a season, and then the devil left him. And he was his prime target. Come on, church. And so we have to be very, very careful, and we need to expect that this season's going to shift, this season's going to change, and there's better days and better things on the other side. There's some things we're going to learn, but we're going into another season in God that's going to be a season of reprieve. It's going to be a season of recollection. It's going to be a season of rest. And to me, rest is very, very simple. It simply means it's an acronym, restoring everything Satan took. Come on. That's what rest is me, and rest comes no other way than by faith. Are we all there? So I need to get into the message a little bit, and I've also been there over the years walking through some of the pains of individuals that their company shut down, and they lost their job, they lost a child, they've lost a career, they've lost a dear friend, they've lost a spouse, they've lost a loved one. Kathy uh, knows that whole situation with they lost a spouse, Tara lost her father, Melissa. Uh, so this whole thing, so we have to understand that this is, this is life. This is where it is. It's not fair. The enemy's not fair. But these are things. But when I started preparing this here, before I even go to where I'm going to be zeroing in, the first psalm that I ever memorized in, 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 in my life 41 years ago was Psalm 23. It was very, very dear to me. The Lord is my shepherd. The word shepherd over there speaks about the restorer. Come on now. How many can say God is my restorer? And the writer says, I shall not want, I shall not lack. And I got the understanding of the Lord as my restorer, the Lord as my shepherd right from the beginning. He makes me lie down in green pastures, it says, and he leads me by still waters. But then it goes on, it says, he restores my soul. Okay? So this is the point that I want to zero in on this morning. Restore my soul literally means to cause my life to return. In other words, there's people here today, uh, the people here today, you don't feel like you have a life, okay? And God says, I'm going to cause your life 
to return to you. As a matter of fact, another definition of this here word restore means he's going to replenish your life. He's going to bring your life back to the original state of the way he wants it to be. Restoring my soul means God's going to keep me going and give me the enjoyment to have life back again today. How many, how many want their life back again? Come on, okay? And so we recognize there's some things about this here that God wants us to know. I like when it says in the book of Isaiah 58, it says, the Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an everlasting spring. Some of you will rebuild in the desert ruins of your cities, and then you will be known as rebuilders of the walls and restorers of homes. So we can see all the way through the scriptures in the old, all the way through in the gospels of Jesus, all the way through in the New Testament that he wants us to restore us. Afterwards, if you look even in 1 Peter chapter 5, we were at before, it speaks about after the hit, after the blow, God says he's going to strengthen you, he's going to restore you, and he's going to refresh you. Can you say amen? How many like the afterwards? How many don't like the before words? Come on. Okay. So as I was preparing for this, and I shared this in the first service, and I'm going to just share, uh, it was Thursday night, Kathy was over here for girl time, and they were doing a, a rehearsal over here with all the different teams, and, and I was just, just preparing for the message on Thursday night of what I was sharing on. And all of a sudden, I, I just felt the Holy Spirit give me a download. And amazingly, the things that I'm sharing, going to share with you, we had people in my ushers are here, and the prayer lines came up afterwards and said people were responding to these here things and, and how they left here different than how they came in. Amen? Well, that's what it is. And this is what I heard God saying, okay? Uh, I, I heard there are people here today that have been devastated. There are people here that have been broken and they're shattered. And today he's going to break the prison locks off your mind. Heard God say, and I was preparing for Sunday morning. This is on Thursday night. And then I heard, he said there was four women, and he gave me this here. And he, and he said there was three men. So I'm typing this as fast as I can, and just in the presence of God, writing these down. And he said there was three men who were consumed over long periods of time. And he used these words who are so bitter that they have entertained giving up and going back into bondage. Okay. And, and they spoke these words, why try, who cares, and, you know, I'm just lost, and, and they're really in a deep pit of despair, but I also sense God's spirit was saying that if they hear what's going to be said today, they're coming out of that pit, amen? And I got 20 minutes to finish this here up. And then I heard the Holy Spirit say this here, that the root of rejection was so strong in several people that are here, and they could be those watching by live stream, that they actually felt like they were dying and the enemy had roared against their minds over and over with these words. And I heard it three times, loser, loser, loser. And I actually saw something, a, a picture when that came to me, and I'm typing this here down, was when my grandfather, Shematero, had passed away. My daddy had asked me, I was 10 years old, and he had asked me to come to the hospital with him. And I'll never forget going into that room over there, and they had all these big machines, and they had all this oxygen. I'm, my grandfather was a smoker, and he had, um, he had emphysema, and, and he was in his last days, and my daddy wanted me to come in to go with him. And so I went, and I freaked out, man. I was like, I freaked out. I, I just saw him that day and all these machines, and, and, he's, and he's trying to breathe, and you could hear the wheezing that was going on, even with all the oxygen going in. And that same, the next day was when my grandfather died. Okay, and it had a lasting impact in my life. And I felt to just say that that's what this rejection feels like, that you can't get another breath. It just seems like you're dying on the inside. And God said he brought you here because he's going to give you life today, amen? And then the Holy Spirit said that there were people here today that have had panic attack after panic. Panic attacks. I, I, I've never had a panic. I, I don't know what that actually means. But it, it said they're increasingly stronger and stronger. And the Holy Spirit said he's here today to deliver you. And he's going to restore your soul. And then, then I heard there's a former clergyman. And I didn't know if it was the pastor. I didn't know if it was an evangelist. I didn't know who it was. But I, I just got, there's a former clergyman that's watching today who felt they have failed so miserably. And have become quite cynical. 
And God said to me, he said, if you will allow the forgiveness towards yourself, you will stop the spiral plunge and things are going to turn around inside your life. But the bitterness and unforgiveness is not towards us, it's towards yourself. And God said, that's a rut that you've been in and it's gone on for a long time and he wants to pull you out of that. And then lastly, I got this here that he said there was two couples that were here that literally have said it's over. And you were just working at the time, okay, in your mind's on how you were going to break it to the kids. And you're here today or watching by live stream. And the Holy Spirit told me that restoration is here and that the Holy Spirit's going to melt down years of hardness of your heart and there's going to be a new ignition of love. There's going to be a new forgiveness and mercy that's going to flow today, okay? And it's going to shift the lie off your minds and his peace will flood the inside of the two of you. Can you all say amen? And then, then we go back, listen carefully, to the book of Job. It says, when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored not some, but his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much of all the possessions that he had had. The Lord gave him the double. So what is uh, the characteristics? And I have to go quick on this here. The characteristics, and then I want to start the message. Is that okay? <laughs> How am I going to get into this here? You just watch, okay? He's persistently, it's a person that needs restoration. Is a person that's persistently down. They're sad, they're depressed, they're anxious, they're empty. And, and the characteristic is they're very moody. They have hopelessness and pessimistic. They see everything from a negative worldview. They're feelings of shame and inferiority and worthlessness and helplessness. This is a fractured soul. This is what God says. He wants to restore the soul. He wants to restore the years that the locust, the canker worm, and the palm worm have stolen from your life. It speaks about they're tired all the time and they have decreased energy. It speaks about they're fatigued and, and, and they're like a depleted energizer bunny. Okay? And, and they have difficulty concentrating. And, and decision making that was easy at one time has now become very complicated and they become confused. And they have trouble sleeping and broken sleeping patterns. They can sleep 10 hours and yet they wake up tired. And then their appetite or can go either one way. They stop eating or they're eating too much. And then the last one was thoughts of despair, quitting, and, and running away. They, they no longer want to get engaged. They're restless. They're, they're unsettled. But everybody look at someone and say, he's here today to restore your soul and to start you living day by day. Now, for time's sake, I'm going to go to the book of Job chapter 1. Everybody go over there for a moment. Okay. I'm going to read chapter 1, and we're going to go right into this here. And I want you now, now that you have the background all laid, okay, it's going to be very easy for me to finish up this message in a short time. Amen. Amen. You say, how are you going to do it? Just wait and see, okay? Everybody say, the unspoken hero. Yes. So look what it says in Job 1. It says, there was once a man named Job who lived in the land of Ur, and he was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from you. Would you say he was a good man? Okay. It said he had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and he employed many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in the entire area, and Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts, literally parties in their homes, and they would also invite three sisters to celebrate with them. And when these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and offer a burnt offerings for each of them, and then notice what he said. For Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. And this was Job's regular practice. Now, how many know he was doing a good thing? He was offering sacrifices, but how many know he was doing it more out of fear? Perhaps, or maybe in the future, this one's going to get off track, or perhaps, or what's it going to be like my children? And, and so worry was part of it that was rooted in the fear that greatly consumed his life. Are you all there? So he was doing the right things, but fear was still at the root issue of his life. Very important. So it says, and then it says over there, Job's first test. One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the, Lord and the accuser Satan came with them. And where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan, like God didn't know. Come on. And Satan answered the Lord and said, I've been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Now, how many know we read that over in 1 Peter chapter 5, 8? Stay alert. Be attentive. Why? For your adversary, the great adversary, the devil, walketh about as the wrong line. So I'm going to know we have a different picture of what the enemy's trying to do over there. And it brings you a picture of where he's at. And it says, he is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. But go ahead. Go to the next verse, if you will. And look what he says here. 
okay? Satan replied to the Lord, yes, but Job has good reasons to fear God. Keep going down, if you will. And it says, you have always put a word, a, a wall of protection. Everybody say a hedge of protection around him. And what else have they put a hedge of protection? Around his home. What else? And his property. And you have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. Now, now here's the key. How many know the hedge was already down in Job's life? Did you hear what I just said? And the enemy already knows it, so God's right over here. And then look what happens over here. This is so important that you get this, but reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Now go ahead, write down, if you will, in verse number 12. All right, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan, do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan let the Lord's presence. How many know he couldn't harm him physically because Job's sin is never imputed until knowledge comes? But how many know that still doesn't make it right for the hedge because Satan is a legalist? And so important that you get this here. So it goes to the next verse. Go ahead, if you will. And so look at verse number 13. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting. Come on, isn't it amazing? The thing that had consumed them was to worry about his kids turning away from God and, and, and the worry and the fear that he had at the oldest brother's house. Come on, and then look what happened. A messenger arrived at Job's house with the news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them. Keep going as fast. And when the, uh, the Sabaeans raided us, they, they stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. And I'm the only one escaped to tell you. Isn't it amazing that there was only one that got out to tell him the bad news. And while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with the news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and the shepherds, and I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Verse 17, while he was still speaking, what? A third messenger arrived with the news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed. Just think about that, all the camels that Job had. And it said, your servants and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Isn't it amazing? Go to the next verse out there. And while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived. So, so how many have ever heard the saying, when it rains, it pours? Well, how many know one hit after the next? But let me just ask a question. Who was the one that was causing all the havoc? It wasn't God that was doing it. It's the enemy that was doing it. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with the news. Your sons and daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. And then look what happened over here. Suddenly, a powerful wind. Was it a hurricane? Was it a tornado? We don't know what it was. But it swept in from the wilderness and the house on all sides. And the house collapsed. And all your children are dead. And I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Now, I don't know about you, but Job lost everything. Come on. And then afterwards, listen very carefully. Job stood up. He tore his robe in grief. And then he shaved his head and he fell to the ground to worship. And then look at the next verse over here. And it says, he said, I came naked from uh, my mother's womb and I naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. Yeah. You hear that at funerals. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be his name. And isn't it amazing? It tells who the culprit was that did it. That's right. Amen. That's right. If you believe God's the one that's just taking from your life, he's already got a hook inside your life. He's already penetrated into your life. And all this Job did not sin by blaming God. But look at chapter, go, go to the next verse. Go, go right down. Okay, one day the members of the heavenly court came again to present themselves before the Lord. And then the accuser Satan came with them. Come on. And then look what happened over here. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I've been patrolling the earth. There's 1 Peter chapter 5. Watching everything that's going on. Keep going down. Then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He's the finest man in the earth. He's blameless, a man of complete integrity, fears God, and stays away from evil. And, and, and he has maintained his integrity, even though you urged me to harm him without cause. Look at this here. Satan replied to the Lord, skin for skin, a man will give up everything to save his life. Look what God says over there. Uh, but reach out and take away his health, and he will surely curse you to your face. Look at the next verse over there. All right, do what you are as you please. The Lord said to Satan, but spare his life. Here's the key. The fear opened up Job's life. And if you don't understand this aspect about the spiritual battle, it's not God. 
And the writers over here are trying to understand this whole thing. And they're translated to the best they have knowledge. But they didn't have understanding of the whole kingdom of darkness until we got the New Testament epistles that share exactly. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. The strategist, the legalist, the accuser, the wicked spirits in the high places that are attacking. Come on. So who is it that struck Job? So Satan fell, uh, left the Lord's presence and he struck Job with terrible boils from head to who made them that way? Who was the one that put the spoils? Who's the one that put those things on them? Who's the one that wants to get them things off him? God. Okay, so look at the next verse. This is where I want to start. So Job scraped his skin with a piece of broken potter as he sat among the ashes. And look what happened over here, if you will. His wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. How many know uh, probably not the greatest words that he need to hear? But let me tell you something. The two of them were in agony. He's in physical agony, but she didn't lose one child. She didn't lose two children. She didn't lose three kids. She lost 10 kids. She lost all of her livestock. She lost everything that they had worked for all their life. And it all happened in a day. So in her despair, she's saying, listen, man, why don't you just curse God? And Job, why don't you just die? Look what he said over there. But Job replied, you talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job said nothing wrong. Now go, if you will, to Job chapter 42. We're going to have to move. I've got to get started now. Are you all there? And I will get this done in the next 10 minutes. You say, how are you going to do that? Just watch and see. You will see a miracle, okay? Now, now, what you need to understand, and I got this written down just to summarize this here, okay? Three things you need to understand. Number one is Job chapter one, Satan attacks his family. If you have been around any time in the Christian journey, your greatest attack is going to come against your family. If you haven't learned number two, Job, Job, Satan attacked his health. Okay, I'm not going to get into the time, the details about the health attacks that I had a few years back. God turned it all around. God restored, and I'm on the mend. Can you all say amen? But we've had health attacks. In Job chapter 3, it's where we uh, washes, uh, Job wishes that he was never born. In Job chapter 4, all the way through to 38, you see his three friends come by and his friends speak all types of things. They said, it's because of sin in your life. It's because of rebellion in your life. This is the chastening of the Lord in your life. And it's all things that they shared with him that are all accounted and truly stated, but they're not necessarily statements of truth. And then, then listen very carefully, and then we see something uh, 37 chapters, it goes that way. Then in chapter 40, God comes on the scene and he rebukes Job. He said, listen, dude, the things that you have spoken about me, they ain't right. Come on. What's the things he spoke? The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh, blessed be his name. And how many know Job says, I repent of those things in sackcloth and ash. Now, now with all that in mind, you need to go to Job 42, and this is where I got to get my message. Are you all there? And it says in chapter 42, for time's sake, let's go in verse number 7. I, I wish I had time to go the whole thing. We read that this morning in the scripture reading from Margaret. It says over here, after the Lord had finished speaking to Job, okay, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I'm angry with you and your two friends. Come on. How I many know they spoke for over 30 chapters? How many know religion has a lot to say, but there's very little substance in what they got to say? We're just going to leave that for another day, okay? And it says, for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. And he says, so take seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer a burnt offering for yourself. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer on your behalf. I will not treat you as you deserve. Aren't you glad God doesn't treat us as we deserve? For you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. Now, now, we already know Job already made it right for the things he said. Okay? And then Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuite, and Zophar, the Namanite, did as the Lord commanded, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. How many know that those guys came and put condemnation, put shame and guilt upon his life? And, and let me just state it. There's Christians that do the same thing today. There's Christians that are very quick to speak 
and to judge things that they don't know what's going on. Rather than come alongside and say, listen, man, I'm going to help you get through this thing. Come on, man, I'm going to pull you out of this here pit. Come on, girl, you're coming out of this here rut. Come on. And how many know we need encouragement? We don't need the discouragement from the Job's comforters, all right? There's another whole message. I don't have time, but in these next minutes, hang on. So it says, when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. I just wonder how many today have been hurt, have been burnt, have been betrayed like myself, and others have been betrayed. I just wonder if you started praying for those there people, if God would not restore and turn things around inside your life. And maybe he's just waiting for a response, but there's a point that I want to get on. It said, then all his brothers and sisters, former friends, came and feasted with him at his home, and they consoled him and comforted him because of all the trials that the Lord had brought against him. We recognize who's the one that brought against him? Satan, thank you. And each of them brought him a gift of money. And come on, what else? And a gold ring. Okay, and then look what happened over here in the next verse, 12. It said, so the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life even more than in the beginning. For now he had 14,000 sheep. How many did he start off with? Seven. He had 6,000 camels. How many did he start off with? Thousand teams of oxen. How many did he start off with? And a thousand female donkeys. But look at this next part, because this is where I got to summarize the whole message. I'm going to have to do it in a hurry. He also gave Job seven more sons, come on, and three more daughters. Now, this is the point that I want to bring out. Look at the next three. It names the daughters. He named his first daughters, what did he name her? Jemima, the second, Kezia, and the third, Karen Habach. Now, that might not mean anything to you right now. But in the Bible, it very seldom ever names the women. Jesus had James, Josie, Simeon, how many know, all the brothers, and it says, and his sisters are amongst us. It mentions the ones with Keturah that Abraham had, all the males, and it mentions all the grandsons, but it doesn't mention the females. Over here, it's amazing, he named his first daughter Jemima, and the second Kezia, and the third Karen Kabuch, and then look at the next verse, it says over there about them, it said they're the most beautiful, look at verse number 15, it says, in all the land, no women were as, come on, lovely as the daughters of Job, and their father put them into his will along with their brothers, and then look at 16, this is amazing what happened, Job lived 140 years after that, living to see four generations of his children and grandchildren, how many could say God restored? everything back. But how did it all happen? It all happened with number one, the first daughter that Job had. What was her name? The first one out there. Come on. The first one. Jemima. How many love Aunt Jemima pancakes? That's one thing to enlighten and have the syrup of Aunt Jemima. But the reality is Jemima means day by day. When he named Kezia, he's speaking about the steps of restoration. And Mrs. Job and, 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 and Job got together and they said, listen, man, we've been burned. We've lost it all. We've done it. But day by day, we're going to get better. Day by day, our hope is in God. Day by day, we're going to move forward. Day by day, we're going to progress progress. Day by day, we're going to get up. We're not staying in the mire. We're not staying in what could have been. We're not staying in what should have been. We're not staying in our past. But day by day, we're going to get back up again. The next name is Kezia. And Kezia is a very interesting word. I got all the ushers. Hand them out, guys. Hand them out right now. We got cinnamon for everybody here. Okay? Because the name Kezia and please do not eat the cinnamon. Okay, it is not candy. It's a spice. But it's given as a reminder. And interesting enough, and there's so many things I want to say about Jemima, but we don't have time right now. But the second one is Kezia. And Kezia speaks about a sweet-scented spice. Literally in all my dictionaries, it mentioned about an aroma. It mentioned about a smell. It mentioned about something that went up to God. Come on. And the Bible says to the believer in the New Testament, let us offer to God the sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to God. Can you all say amen? In every circumstance of life, give thanks. Keep the right heart. Keep the right attitude. God has a deliverance. God has a restoration. God has the power for your life. But here's the thing. Cassia literally means... And there's all the health benefits. Just type in online, health benefits of, 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 slow down. 
health benefits of cinnamon. And you'll see it's an anti-inflammatory. If you ever get prideful, get a swollen head, how many know Kezia reminded is going to bring it right down in the line? Amen. And all the characteristics have a spiritual parallel. But here's the thing about it. When I was over in Italy and I was with my wife and, and we opened up and, and we had uh, Motto and I had some of these here called uh, anchovies. Amen. And if I was to open this up right now, if you're Sicilian or Italian, you would just say that's a heavenly aroma. But if you're anything else, you're going to say that's from hell, okay? And, and my wife, we were in the car, and I opened it up, and man, Mar Maro and I goes, Rick, you're a real Sicilian, and he hugged me, and he kisses and takes my cheek and squeezes it, and, and we started eating these here things, and the girls are in the back seat. We're on our way to Venezia, and they said, that's disgusting. Roll the windows down. This is terrible. Well, how many know there's none that are perishing? It's the smell of odor. Come on now. On the road to destruction. But us that are saved, it's a sweet aroma. And what I recognized about Kezia was there was an aroma of gratitude. After the dust settled, they started focusing on it. wasn't God. They started focusing on the goodness of God. Can you say amen? amen. amen. When I put this on, I spray it on. It's called Polo Black. I got Gucci, Tommy Hilfiger, and all the others. But when I put polo black on, my girl comes at me. Amen? There, there, there's, there's an attraction to it. That smell just goes up. The best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. And she just wakes up and just comes at Come on now. Anyway, so I got one by the bed. I got one in the office. I got one in the car. I got one everywhere we go. So it's all there. We'll leave that for another day. Can you all say amen? So the point I want to bring is what's the aroma that's attracting God or is it attracting the demonic? Because I've learned, I've learned that all our criticalness, all the murmuring and negativity, it attracts the kingdom of darkness. And it brings all the fruit of darkness to our lives. But Job and his wife came to the place where, yes, we're coming into rest. We're coming into contentment. We're coming into the place where we're picking up the pieces and going on with our life. For a woman to lose one child is enough, but for a woman to lose ten at one, she is in pain. She's the unspoken hero. But there's one more that I have to make reference to you. Come on now. And put that up if you will. Her name is Karen. Listen to this here name. Karen Hapooch. Okay? Yeah. Karen Hapooch. Okay? What does Karen Hapooch mean over there? Well, I'm glad you asked because you're so interested. Okay? So it doesn't mean cinnamon. This is that's got two meanings to this here word. And the number one meaning to this here word is face paint. I said, what is this all about? So I started looking it up and going into all my dictionaries. And, and it literally means the woman got up and she started fixing up her appearance. She started putting makeup on, face paint. She got, how many know depressed people, uh, wounded soul people don't want to look good? They just want to stay where they're at. So she got up and she started putting the, putting the makeup on. And then she started, this is all Rick now, come on, come on now, because I know that they had 10 kids. So she got over to Job and she said, Job, it's time for us to pick back up. Everything we lost was all stolen, but it's time to pick our lives back up again. Come on, boy, we're going to the tent tonight. We're going to the tent of meeting tonight. We're going we're, we're gonna to get it on tonight. Come on now. Now get upset at me. Get upset whatever you want, but I want to just say something. Child number one means that they had to have it at least one time. <laughs> Child number two, they had to have it at least two times. I mean, I mean I'm not a rocket scientist. I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist. All I know is they had a time in the tent of meeting, and the two of them got their life back together, and they said, we're not staying in the rut of the past. We already brought the offering of gratitude to God. We're moving on with our life. We're going forward with our life, and we're going to have kids, and God's going to give us one. And after he gave him one, he gave him two. After he gave him two, he gave him three. He gave him seven sons, and then he gave him three daughters. Why? Because seven is the number of divine completeness. Three is the number of the Godhead. It was a miracle of God's grace that was released upon us. But it doesn't end there. The word Karen Kapooch, not only does it mean the restoration, not only does it mean faint, uh, face paint, not only does it mean put the makeup on, get in the tent, look good, put the sheets out there, or so everything's going to be good. We're going to have a good night tonight. But it also means horns of plenty. What does that mean? Her strength came back 
again, which means the joy of the Lord, which is their strength, came back into her life. And horns were always the thing that the enemy, listen, that when you're going to war, an animal's horns are the things that go at the one that's attacking them. She got her horns back up again, and she took the enemy out, not just once, but ten different times. That's why she's the hero of the Bible. Let's all stand to our faith. You may be here today in that valley, and maybe you haven't even taken the first step. Maybe God brought you here today to say it's time to get out of the rut. It's time to move forward. And if that's you, wherever you're at, I want you to take a step. Just, just take a step. Step out in the aisles wherever you're at. Just take a step. Start moving forward again. Because the enemy's not going to keep you down any longer. I want everybody that's taking that step, everybody lift your hands up right now and say, God, I thank you today that God is good. I thank you that God is just. I thank you that God is faithful. Forgive me for all the concepts of God that go contrary to your word. God, this day, I bring an offering of gratitude today to break the enemy's lies, to break out, to break out of this season to break out of that depression, to break out of that heaviness, to break out of that worry, to break out of that fear, and to move forward in my king. Come on now. And the third step, man, everybody look at something and say, shine. Shine. That's what that word Karen Kabuch means to me. Shine with face paint. Come on now. What does that mean? Be imitators of God. It's the same word. It's the same word used of Moses when he came down from the mountain. The glory of God came back on his life. The honor of God came back on his life. Why? Because when God restores you, it's going to be the years of the locust, the years of the canker worm, the years of the palmer worm are all coming back your way, and you're going to learn about faith. You're going to learn about the rest of God. You're going to learn about the hope of God, and you're going to taste and see that God is good. And everybody said, amen.